Hi there. We are so glad you joined us today for this message. We hope you enjoy it. Kick back, learn about Jesus, and be blessed. Talk to you soon. Yesterday we had a, a memorial service for a good friend of mine uh, who passed away. And uh, they uh, they uh, asked me to close the service, and it was a blessing. And... Uh, you know, I'd, I'd asked Michael, I said, you know, can you do this, Michael? Because I was preparing for doing the men's breakfast because nobody said, I want to do it. I know there's men that'll do it, but I didn't want to force anybody to do it. And, I, and then the Lord said, Michael. Yeah, okay. Because I figured I'm going to prepare for this thing and I'm going to, you know, I, we talked last week about how you have these dreams and these messages and everyone, you know, on my head. And, and uh, so uh, I asked Michael and I sat at my desk for a minute and I prayed. I was like, Lord, what would you have me say tomorrow about Jack, my brother Jack? And uh, he said, speak from your heart the way Jack did. I had no notes. I had a finger in my Bible, and when I opened it, there's the scripture that I needed to read, and I spoke from my heart. Uh, very unpolished, unperfect, but it glorified that man. And I'm telling you, when you step forward and you just do what God puts on your heart and speak from your heart, it's more amazing than when you prepare something. Uh, Still, I have done more weddings than funerals. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> I know one day that's going to change as we all get older. Uh, so, I said that to say that if you if you need, we're, like I said, we're going to go visit James afterwards. Uh, I didn't. I don't know exactly what's going on, but let us know what's going on because that's what we're to do: is to love one another. Because if I have a funeral one day and one of these gentlemen here are speaking about me, I want them to have something to say. That was the only funeral I've ever done. I, I'm, I'm not saying ever done, but I'm the only fun, funeral I was confident in saying, this man is in heaven. Because I knew him and I watched his walk. And I knew what he did in my life. And I used to have a shirt and I don't know what happened to it, but I used to have a shirt that said, live your life so that the preacher does not have to lie at your funeral. And, uh, and so I, I say that to you because that's a serious thing we need to think about as we have our days. So Mrs. Smart was in church and she was fumbling with her purse as the offering plate was coming by. And out of her purse fell a large TV remote onto the ground and... The usher was there, and he, he bent over, and he picked it up, and he said, Do you always bring the TV remote to church with you? And she said, No, I don't. She said, But my husband refused to come today with me, and it was the evilest thing I could do that was legal to him. <laughs> was to carry the remote with her. You got it? Okay. All right. God bless you all. All right. We're in uh, Acts. We're going to finish um, chapter 23 today of Acts. Miracles of the promise. Small miracles. <clears throat> One of the things, sorry. One of the things we've been talking about in all of our studies is that in the study in the Old Testament to, to Revelations, in all of our studies on on Tuesday with the men and on, on Wednesday and Thursday and Saturday is being reminded. We need to be constantly reminded of what God did for us and who we belong to, right? Constant reminders we need because we'll forget. And it's easy to forget. So this, this miracles of the promise is something that we're gonna, I'm going to point out to you today as we read. We're going to start in Acts 23 at, at verse 12. And I'm going to go ahead and just pray and open this up. Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the glory uh, 
that you reveal to us day to day, Lord. We thank you for the, the love that you give us, Lord. We just ask that we be good stewards of that love in this world, in this current world today, in our lives. Um, reflect you. Let your word speak to us today in Jesus Christ, our Savior's name. Amen. So the very first verse here, I'm going to go back just a little bit. Verse 11, and uh, this is where we ended. It says, in the following night, after all this stuff happened to Jesus, the following night, or to Paul, the following night, the Lord stood near him and said, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. And we talked about that because he felt... I believe he felt discouraged because he was finally at the place where he could speak to the people he wanted to speak to the most and it didn't work out the way he thought it was going to work out. And so the Lord came next to him and said, look, be of good cheer, be of good courage, don't be afraid because the way you did this now, you're going to do this in Rome. So we talked about having that Superman suit. Now I know the Lord told me, I, all the way to Rome, nothing's going to happen to me. I have the protection of the Lord. After I get to Rome, I don't know. But for this little piece, I know I've got the protection of the Lord. What confidence you could have in that, right? If you knew the Lord was going to protect you from here to there. Well, you know that when you accept him, I'm telling you guys, when you accept him as your Lord and Savior, to the time you're standing in front of him, you have that protection that Paul was given in his ear by the Lord standing next to him. You just don't realize it. Forget who we are. <clears throat> so the next morning, some of the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves to an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. Uh, so the next morning, right? So here's Paul, right? He goes to sleep. The Lord comes to him and says, Be of good courage. Don't be afraid. I've got stuff for you to do. You're, you're doing fantastic. You're doing a great job. I love you and I have more things for you to do. And you know, waking up in the next morning and, yes, the Lord spoke to me last night, right? Joy. Where does that come from? In the morning? In uh, Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 21 through 25. Don't have that many verses today, but they're powerful. This I recall to mind. What would, I, what would we just say? We have to be reminded. It's a good one. This I recall to mind. Therefore, I have hope. How many of you have lost your hope this week? More than once, maybe. Yeah. You forgot. That's the whole reason why you get afraid or anything when you're in Christ. It's because you forgot. <clears throat> Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, man. Because of his compassion, because his passion, compassion does not fail. Uh, there are, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. New every morning. That's what Paul's waking up in. New every morning. That compassion, that faith, that renewing. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. For there, therefore, I hope in him. How many of you have talked to people and when they talk about the Bible, they'll talk about a certain thing, like say the rapture. I'm going to be taken out. I'm going to be taken out. I won't be here. I don't need to know about revelations. I don't be here. I don't need, cause, and, and, or they'll focus on something else. I am healed. I'm completely healed and totally healed. And I'm, and, because they're focusing, that's where their hope is. The hope's in the rapture. Being taken out, not having to go through, or their hope is in being totally healed physically in their bodies, totally healed. But the hope's misleading because it's supposed to be in Christ, which brings all those things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. 
For the Lord is my portion, says my soul. When you wake up in the morning, do you say that? Do you think that? I mean, this is powerful to me. It gives me the goosey pimples. Right? The Lord is good to those who wait for Him. Dang it. That's like a little kid I see in my mind. And, uh, and it's like, I don't see no cars. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And uh, dad's behind you going, wait for me. Wait. 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 Okay. Grab my hand. Let's go. Right? We don't want to wait. I see an opening. There's candy over there. You know, whatever it is. Uh, <clears throat> to the souls who seek him. The Lord is good to those who wait and to the souls who seek Him. Are you seeking Him today? Let's find Him. Let's dance with Him in His Word. Amen? So fear is a result of forgetting who God is and who you are, you are, who you are and who you belong to in Christ. And He tells him, take courage. In verse 14, uh, how many of us wake up in that same spot? Right? Verse 13, it says, more than 40 men were involved in this plot. And they went to the chief priests and the elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now, do you see how that's backed down? Their, their zeal has backed down already. Because before they said, we're taking an oath, we're not going to drink or eat until we kill this man. And now they come before the chief priest. Hey, we're not going to eat until we kill this guy. We said drink. Shut up. Stop it. Do you know what happens if you don't drink for so many days? It might take us a while, guys. I'm rethinking this thing, right? That's the way men view their promises or their oaths. Well, it didn't quite work out the way I thought it would. But what is God's promise? Always. Never fails. Amen? Never fails, but man's does. If it's bad or if it's good, man fails. Okay? Um, so these guys were Jewish assassin, assassins. And you can look them up and find out more about them, but they were men who were in the Jewish religion that were called dagger men, and they carried daggers underneath their clothes. And one of the things they were known for, they were known as cutthroats, but they were known for cutting the throats of the Roman guards. So when they found an opportunity, they'd just come around and, whoosh, whoosh, and just keep walking, and put that away. They were, that was their job. That's when they found an opportunity, they'd take them out. Uh, and they had a seat, or they had a place they, with, the, uh, with the high priest and with the authorities and everything. So they were known about, but they, I don't ever see where they were given assignments to. They kind of come upon themselves to do these things. And it's like, yeah, we know. We don't, we don't uh, put you guys out in front of everybody, but we know you're there. And you do good work. You're getting rid of Romans. So now they turn it to Paul. <clears throat> right? So the thing that they do here in 15 is they, they say, Now then, you and the Sanhedrin uh, petition the commander to bring him before you uh, on the pretext of wanting to know more accurately information about his case. And we will be ready to kill him before he gets here. They're going to take him out while they're bringing him from lock up from the commander's lock up to the Sanhedrin court will take him out in the way that we do 40 men against one and probably uh, he had uh, two chains on him right he had two chains on him so when he's, he's walking with two chains there's two soldiers and probably two more soldiers probably four soldiers and 40 guys are going to take him out on the way on the way there so that's man's odds, right? But God already told him, hey, until you get to Rome, <clears throat> you're protected. And he believed that. So they're trying to get the 
Sanhedrin, the chief priests, to lie to the commander, to manipulate the commander, which could get them killed uh, in order to kill Paul. And they all agree, hey, we'll do this thing, right? <coughs> now, in uh, verse 16, it's, uh, it's kind of neat what happens here. Verse 16. But uh, when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. When the son of Paul's sister. How many of you knew till this point that Paul had a sister? We kind of discovered and I kind of touched on that he had a wife at one point because he was part of the Sanhedrin. To be a part of the Sanhedrin, you had to have a wife. Um, but now he's, he's, being, he's, he's traveling as a single man. We know about his writings where he says that if you can do this and live this way, it's better for you. Uh, so when we think about families, when we think about our family, we think about this church family, Part of that church family is people who are single. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. That's a very powerful statement before God to be able to be that way. Uh, It's not necessarily being a totally independent person. It's being dependent on the Lord is 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 the, uh, the technique used here. So, uh, anyways, his nephew comes. And uh, and tells Paul, and <clears throat> so uh, the, to, for me, um, I just wrote a note here that uh, uh, family for family. Right now, what does it say that's going to happen? And Jesus says several times that that uh, father will portray son and son will father and daughter and mother-in-law and, and I'll put them up to death and everything else. But here's a case where family says, hey, that's my Uncle Paul. Not happening. Right? That's what we're talking about doing, what we're, what we're wanting to be. We stand up for family. Hey, there's a plot coming against you. These guys are trying to do something. And I know it hurts because these are the people you want to save and you love, but they're trying to mess you up, Uncle Paul. And he says, hey, okay, I know what to do. Uh, so what does he do? He says to uh, 16, he says, but when uh, the son of Paul's sister heard about the plot and went to the barracks, told Paul, then Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took the, him to the commander, and the centurion said, Paul the prisoner. Paul the prisoner. This is unique here, because uh, has Paul been charged with any crime at this point? No, that's why, that's why they're saving his life, because he hadn't been charged. They can't find anything that he's done wrong. So he, but he's a prisoner. Now, I want you guys to understand from this, mo- this, this point when they took him into the barracks to save his life, he becomes a prisoner the rest of the book of Acts. Uh, he's on like a house lockdown for your own good, right? Uh, <clears throat> but no crime against him. I just thought it was neat the way that... Uh, Uh, Luke makes sure that we know that he is a prisoner. He's confined as a prisoner. So, uh, turn the page. It says, bring him, bring this young man. (coughs) He told me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. Now, here's something else really unique. Um, It says, the commander took the young man by the hand and drew him aside and asked him what is it you want to tell me all right so here's a point just I don't want to get way off but I just want to tell you guys here's a point if you are making up a story would you add a detail like he took that man by took that young man like by the hand and led him aside you you wouldn't add something like that 
if this was all a lie and Luke's telling a big story. But the reason why he adds that in there is so that we know that this is a, a, a something that was seen. This is an eyewitness occasion where this guy took, and it also tells us that this, this young man is a young man. He's little. Because normally you would say, come on with me. So he's probably a little guy who found out this plot against, and now he's talking about it. And he's being led to, to uh, aside with the commander to tell him what he has heard. And <clears throat> also, too, here's, here's another thing, is this small detail added in there proves that it was an eyewitness account. But uh, in this, we see this small miracle happen. And, and we think sometimes about miracles, and we're like, oh, no. We've got to raise somebody from the dead, and, or this or that, but a baby being born, a baby being conceived. Maybe I'm weepy about miracles, but I think they're a lot, a lot more finite than we think. This young boy, hearing this news and then knowing what to do with it, is a miracle. That's God going, hey, you go over here, and over here this, and then you go over there. Right? Now, you can't convince me not. Uh, uh, if, you, if you don't see that, then you don't see that. But I definitely see God working in a, in a marvelous way with this little small miracle with this boy here. So in 20, it says, he said, some of the Jews have agreed uh, to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. That's a lot for a little kid to retain. Right? A little kid that would be led by the hand. So that just tells me again. That's, that's God. If we can tell a little kid. Hey go ask your mama this. And then by the time they get all the way in. And the cat. Doggy. You know all the way to mama. You're like uh Dad wanted something. Or miracle stories. Uh, I was walking down the riverbed one time with my grandkids. And I twisted my ankle and I had a bum knee. And I was literally claw- crawling in, the, in, the, uh, in intense pain in the riverbed. I couldn't stand up. Uh, and uh, I said, go get your grandma. And the kids took off to go get grandma. And I don't know, I made it almost back to them. And Grandma said, where's your papa at? And they said, oh yeah, he told us. They could tell you to go get him. <clears throat> yeah, I like the pretty rocks, Grandma. Papa's crying down there. <laughs> Half hour later. <clears throat> but it's a miracle that all of a sudden she realized I wasn't going to make it that far. Um, so... Enough of that. Let's get over here. And uh, so, in in uh, <clears throat> he tells them everything that they're going to do. In twenty one, he says, "Do not give them. Uh, do not give in to them, because more than forty men of them are waiting to ambush him, and they have taken an oath not to." Eat or drink until they have killed him. And now they are ready and waiting uh, for your consent to their request. So that's a lot for a little kid. But he, he was there and heard the oath, the real oath at the beginning where they said they won't eat or drink. So uh, wherever they were talking, whenever they were talking, uh, he caught that and reported it. So the commander, in 22, the commander dismisses the young man with this warning. Do not tell anyone uh, that you have reported this to me. Do not tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Tell no one. And then, now he knows the plan, so the plan has been foiled by this little boy. That's a miracle of God. This whole thing is a miracle of God. Little tiny 
pieces of a miracle that add up to a big promise. Amen? So in 23, it says, Then, they, then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, Get ready for a detachment of 200 soldiers and 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at 9 tonight. So the, the Lord is providing, that's like saying, you know, you're going to have a small army protecting you all this way. But then he adds even more to it. He says in 24, provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to the governor Felix. So he is over over proportioning the armies here and adding horses so that means that Paul is going to continue to have a fresh horse not just one horse horses for Paul not we're not going to stop we're going and we're not going to stop we're just going to keep transferring him when that horse gets tired when that horse gets tired we're going to make sure that he gets there all the way um, Paul has to be smiling at this point when he knows this is going on. He has to be going, yeah. Look at what God can do. <clears throat> Once again, proving himself. Now Jesus saves us. Right? And we'll see that. And we'll write that. And we'll have that stickers on our cars. Jesus saves. And put it on billboards. Jesus saves. But he also protects us. That's the part we, we forget sometimes. He saves us, but He also protects us. A lot of us need to remember that. Because we find ourselves spun out into some situations where we think, oh my gosh, who's going to take care of me? The one that saved you. You belong to Him now. Amen? All right, so... Uh, now, he sends a letter. So, you have 470 soldiers going against 40 men. That's way, way, way outweighed, right? These guys are assassins with swords, but they've got swordsmen, spearsmen, soldiers. You don't think that these guys are some kind of special movie ninjas, Right? To take all them guys out. I mean, God's protection. When He protects us, the point is, when He protects us, He will overprotect us to protect us. Right? Now, in, in thinking about that too, He saves him and He protects him, but does He protect Paul from everything? No. There is some stuff we got to go through, right? But there is some stuff that could end his life. You know, he's protected from the end of his life. Because that would have ended his life. Forty guys, trying to get through forty guys to go how many yards to this court. That would have ended his life. This little boy, which God had a hand in all that to do to get him to this point. Where now he saved his life again. And, and we can't see behind the scenes how many times the Lord's done that for you guys. I, I have many, many stories like that where my, I should have died. And most of them do not involve my wife. Actually, none of them involve my wife. Most of them before she was around, when I think about it. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. So then he's, he's letting them know. Uh, he's sending them this, to this letter here, he writes in 25. It says, and he wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysus, Lysus uh, to the excellent Governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized... By the Jews, uh, they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. And I wanted to know why 
they were accusing him. So I brought him to the Sanhedrin, and I found that the accusations that uh, they had against him were questions about their law. But they had no charge against him that he would deserve death or chains or imprisonment. When I informed, was informed of a plot uh, being carried out against this man, uh, I sent him at once. And I also ordered the accusers uh, to pre- present their case against him before you. And uh, so this is a letter that goes, and uh, he's, he's given the whole dispatch. Now all these guys, is 200 or 470 men take off taking him. In 31 it says, And the soldiers carried out the orders. They took Paul with them during the night and brought him to Antipas. Uh, and the next day they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned back to the barracks. So half the guys went with him. They went, and, and if, you, if you look at that, that was the dangerous part. They made the dangerous trip, all of them. And then once they got past the dangerous part, half of them went back and the other half went with them. Uh, and the, probably the 40 guys, they were still hanging out looking for him in Jerusalem. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, when the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. And the governor read the letter and asked what providence he was from, and he learned that he was from Caesarea. And he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. So, here we see he, he makes a statement there and he says, okay, look, I, where is he from? And he finds out he's from Caesarea. So he goes, oh, okay. Because the big thing would have been to what happened to Jesus and happens all the time as they go into places and it's like, where are you from? Okay, push it to the next guy. Push it to the next guy. I can't hear this one because you're not from my area. So he's from my area. I'll hear it whenever your accusers come here. Now, we're not going to go into the rest of the story. I'm going to do something here and go off the page a little bit. We, uh, we're told that uh, in Acts chapter 9, verse 15 and 16, But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name. Now this is when he was blinded and he sent the prophet to give him sight. And he was a little liberal. He didn't really want to go because he didn't, you know, this guy kills people. He kills people like me. And he says, no, no, you go. I have chosen him. And he's assigned there that he's going to go before the Gentiles, before governors and kings. And uh, he will suffer for the Lord. Here he is. This is the beginning of this going before governors. Uh, This is his first authority he's going to go before. And... In uh, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11. I hope I didn't misplace this one a little bit. The Lord will guide you continuously and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like the watered garden and like the spring of water, those waters that do not fail. Yesterday, <clears throat> thank you. Yesterday, Michael brought us a, a, a lesson from Psalms chapter 1. 
about uh, the tree that is planted by the river, flowing river, that it would yield fruit and then always never have drought. This is the same type of deal. Paul is a planted tree, planted by God, put in a place where he is to do the work of God. We also talked about the tree, how the tree gives fruit. The tree doesn't do anything for itself, does it? It's amazing how God uses that as, a, as an analogy. The tree doesn't do anything for itself, but it provides for others a place of shade and something to eat. Uh, that's what Paul's life is about. Shading them from the scorching sun, from the fires giving sustenance and food to people. And He guides you continuously. How many of you need to be guided? It should be like the waters, watered garden. Yeah, we need to be guided. All, every one of us does need to be guided. When we take off on our own, man, you know what's real wet out there where I take off where on my own? I get my truck stuck, I get my shoes muddy. But he's doing something for our bones right there when he's taking care of us. He's strengthening our bones. Man, I pray for strengthening in the bones of our people. Amen. What are the bones of this family? It's the people. The people that hold this family together. By acting and doing the things that Lord, the Lord would have us act and do, right? So, I'm going to take you to John chapter 14. Some promises that Jesus gave. And I want, as we go through these promises quickly, I want you guys to think about little miracles in your life that say that these promises are true in your life, right? The very first one, uh, four, John 14, verse 18. Verse 18. I will not leave you orphans I will come to you does that mean anything to you guys there's a there's a lot to say the Lord tells us that our ministry is to go to the orphans he's not going to leave us orphans what does that mean? That's a regenerating statement there, an understanding and a thought. What's a question an orphan would have? A question an orphan would have. I've got three of them. There's many of them. I just wrote three down. Huh? Who's my mom and dad? That's not one I wrote down. But an orphan will ask... Uh, who can love me? Uh, who will care for me? Who will protect me? Now, if you know the answers to those questions, you're not an orphan. If you can say, who will love me? Well, Jesus. Hey. If you can say, who will care for me, Jesus. Who will protect me? Jesus. You're not an orphan. But that's a question. You understand what I'm talking about? A question that an orphan would have. There's many. Who's my mom and dad? Jesus said when they said, "Come, your family's here, your mother and your brothers, and they, they want you to come out. And he says, who is my mothers and brothers? Who, who are they? But these, my family, right? We think sometimes that we, uh, you know, who, uh, the big thing in Christianity is who would ever love me? How I can't be loved. And things happen in our past that, that just put a stamp on that. Ah, yeah, nobody's never going to love me. Uh, 
and you have people that try to love you and you just push them away. No, I'm not, you know. Or you have that life where everything gets really, really good and is so fantastic and it's like, I don't deserve this and you blow it up. You know, subconsciously or consciously, that happens. Uh, That's an orphan mentality. The next promise that he gives is in 15. Uh, It's in John chapter 14, verse 15 through 17. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and I will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The promise of the Holy Spirit. And he says there. That I will give you another helper. Another advocate. (laughs) You know when I'm talking about protection. And I'm talking about doubling up. A 470. And then we got through the thick part. Now half are you going to go. There's still a half left. Right? Right? What's the half that's left protecting us in our lives right now? The Holy Spirit. Man. Another advocate. Another one just like me. Another one just like me. The Holy Spirit is just like Jesus. If you've seen the Father, you've seen me. Jesus is just like the Father. That's amazing to me how much protection we have if we accept it, if we acknowledge it, if we, if we just take it and know that He loves us. Not because of what you did or what you didn't do or who you are or how much you know, but because He loved you first. Amen? All right, so then this, this last promise here that I want to highlight is in verse 21 of chapter 14 of John. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas Iscariot said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him saying, If anyone loves me, he keeps my, my word, and my Father will love him. And he will come to him and make, and we will come to him and make our home in him or with him. <clears throat> That's a protection. That, that's, that's, that's all of them at one time. You believe you're protected like that? We need to. We need to. That's why he says you can stand firm. You know that the worldly people out there, as good as they may be, worldly people can't stand on this. They will fall before the righteous Lord. That's terrible. But that's our job, right? Jesus says, Father, I thank you that you have blinded these. (laughs) But the ones that you have given me, given to me, no one can snatch them out of my hand. That's a paraphrase. But you understand what he's saying when he says that? Some are blinded. 
We have work to do, amen? We have good work to do that God set before us. We may not know where it's coming. It may be around the corner. It's not just in this church. There's, there should be a sign, and I've always wanted to have a sign right over those doors when you walk out. You're entering the mission field. This is not the mission field. This is a preparation place, right? This is a hospital. Once you're well, get out there. Get out there in your mash unit in your helicopter and pick up, pick them up and bring them in, right? So here's what happens. When you know you're not an orphan and you have the Holy Spirit, another advocate. And uh, did I give you Titus chapter 3 verse 4 and 7? Okay. I know that's one of Michael's favorites, so I've added it in there. 3, Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 7. But when the kindness and love of our God and Savior uh, towards men appeared, when the Savior towards men appeared, It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Through the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Whom He poured on us abundantly through Christ Jesus our Savior. That having been justified by His grace we would become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We don't know what eternal life is. We can't comprehend that. I can just tell you, it goes on and on and on and on and on. And it's not annoying going on like your neighbor when she starts talking or he starts talking. Or when they turn, all those annoying things that seem to go on and on and it's not like that. It's a glorious thing that goes on and on and never stops and never fails and never lets up. Constantly intense. Our lives go, oh, to, oh, to, oh, to, oh. This is something that's always yes and amen, right? It's not here, but it's there. We can walk in it here. So what happens when God comes and makes His home with us? We have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Discouraged people cheer up. Dishonest people clean up. Sour people sweeten up. Conflicted people make up. Sleeping people wake up. And lukewarm people fire up. But the greatest and the most important thing is that Jesus Christ is lifted up. Amen? And in that, we can have trust, we can have faith, we can put everything that we have into that. Because we know that we are doing God's work and that He will be pleased. Amen? So can you see any little miracles that have happened in your life that reveal Jesus' promise to you? Did that help see some of them? Or just talking about it helps you see some of them? And you see more of them and more of them and more of them? Don't forget them. Don't forget them. Always meditate in His world. In his word. The miracles of the promise are the precious things that he gives us to remember who and what he is and who and what we are. When this world lets us down and people let us down, we know he never does. Amen. Even when we think, he, we think, oh, he forgot about me. 
He didn't. He saves Paul's life several times, but he also lets Paul go through some rough stuff too. So if you're in a rough patch, rely on him. If you're in a happy, blessed spot, rely on him. And all places in between. Amen. If you guys go out to eat today, when you go to the restaurant, passing this on because I learned this from my brother Jack many years ago. And some of you know that I do this. When you go to the, or I, uh, my wife does it also. When you go to a restaurant and they bring your food, ask the waitress, we're about to pray for our meal. Is there anything we can pray for you about? Little, simple, to the point. Sometimes you'll get no. But man, if you're going to go spend money that God gave you, figure out a way to evangelize with it, right? Amen. Let's close out. Lord, we just thank you for today, Lord. We just thank you for the the words that, uh, that you have given us. We thank you for this love letter that you wrote to us, Lord. We know that you guide us. We know that you protect us. We know that you have poured out your spirit abundantly through Christ Jesus. We we stand in that grace. And we stand in that hope of eternal life, Lord. We just ask as we go this week that you protect us. Bring us together. Bind us together, Lord. But also put somebody in front of us that we can give our testimony and share your love with, Lord. And open our eyes to see those opportunities. And open our eyes to see the opportunities when we can lift one another up and help one another. And we ask those things in Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth's name. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. Thank you guys very much. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you were blessed. If you have any questions, please give us a call, 682-327-7082. We are at 7955 Reed Road in Azle, Texas. Y'all have a good day now, you hear?